In the past, this information has been suppressed, but now it can be told. Every man, woman, and mutant on this planet shall know the truth about de-evolution. Oh, Dad, we're all demo. The following program contains adult language and mature subject matter. Listener discretion is advised. One, 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 one. And now it's one song he... All right, who's going first? I'm going last. Eh, fair. Yeah, I take it you don't want to go first? I don't ever like really going first. Yeah, I, and I don't have a pipping out a really strong one or anything, so I guess I'll go ahead and first. Hey, everybody, well, welcome to One Song Each, the show of musical banter between three pals, where we choose one song each and discuss what that song means to us or doesn't mean to us, and if we like it or don't like it. So I uh, go ahead and put up Betty Davis Eyes by Jackie DeShannon. Who? Becky? Jackie oh. DeShannon. Is there a video... I I expect that there'll be one of those static ones where it's just an, a, it. an image. She let you take her home. It wets her appetite. She'll lay you on a throne. She's got Betty Davis eyes. She'll take a tumble with you. She'll roll you like you a die. Until you come. She looks like the chick from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Now, do you all know who Jackie DeShannon? You ever heard uh, What the World Needs no. Now is Love, Sweet Love? No. Yeah. What the what world, world needs now, now oh, is yeah. love, love, sweet love. love. This is her. She's also the one from Put a Little Love in Your Heart, which you should know since I know you like Scrooge. I don't remember if you like Scrooge, but I know you like Scrooge. Yeah. Remember you know that one? Put a little love in your heart. heart. Yeah. So this is her. This is Jackie DeShannon. She co-wrote this song that's okay. playing now with another mom. Modest singer, not really well known. Donna Weiss. This song eh, sucks, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Let me tell you something. This song is fucking terrible. Yeah. It's, you know, okay, now I want you to do another search. Same song title, but this version is going to be by Kim Carnes. That's the one I know. So you did recognize it eventually? Oh, I know the song. You know the lyrics, at least. Yes, that, the the yeah. musical arrangement on this is. This one's fucking horrible. That's what yeah. I thought. I was going to ask you, is this a cover of It that sounds song? like it should be on a riverboat or something, you know? <laughs> it's a total fucking riverboat. It's that piano. This one, I know this one. It's a staple of the 80s. Her hair is hollow gold Her lips sweet surprise Her hands are never cold She's got better day besides She'll turn her music on you You won't have to think twice She's pure as New York snow She's got better day So I thought this was the original, and I thought the other one was a fucked up cover that we were going to laugh at. No, the original was sung by one of the co-writers, done in 1974, didn't do shit. This version came out almost a decade later, 1981. And as you can see, the arrangement is much different. This is very synth-based, very new wave, totally different singer. Well, no, this feels like a model would walk to this, down the catwalk. Yeah. The other one was, like you said, a riverboat <laughs> with a gambler. See, the lyrics lend to this. Oh, absolutely. Style. The other one was so fucking goofy, dude. It was bubblegum shit. And for the longest time, I thought she wrote this song. I didn't know this was a cover. You'd think because usually the unknown is the one who wrote their own song and they just had a great song where she's known for doing a really great cover of somebody else's song. Although by the same token, you'd make that argument like when somebody gets famous off a cover, it always seems to be like they don't, Blue Monday. they can't follow up. Blue Monday. Orgy's version of Blue Monday. Yeah. 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 Or Carlos Santana. 
Carlos Santana. Yeah. Which one? Black Magic Woman is a cover. Oh, I don't know. That. But Fleetwood Santana's Mac. got Fleetwood Santana's Mac. got a ton right. of versions of I know songs you, you, though. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying. Long, that's, that's, that's that's his biggest song. Black Magic yeah. Woman is, is his biggest song. Right. Uh, no. Oh yeah, como va? Man, the super the super the supernatural yes, that album that was a huge hit. Yeah. No. Nah. I'm just saying that song no, gets a lot right. of play and it's like nobody knew. Mondays, like, yeah. Nobody I, nobody I've knows. I've never heard of them ever again. No. Yeah. They fell right the fuck off. And I actually liked a couple of Orgy songs, but none of them were ever did as well as the I'm cover. Not, yeah. Hell, Marilyn songs. Manson has never done as well as on, on his own well, material. Like like uh, yeah, original know, material is I never know, as big as the covers. Song. Sweet Dreams yeah. is... I mean, well, not just Sweet up. Dreams, though. Even Tainted Love was one of well, her bigger true, hits, yeah. you know? I don't know. Be- beautiful People, Dope Show. He's had some pretty yeah, good songs. I'm not, no, I like Marilyn Manson. I'm not trying to diss him. I'm I'm saying, those are big radio hits. Those are dope shows. a fucking huge radio hit. But none of them were ever as big as the covers he did. He always did better with his covers than he ever did with his original material. I would challenge that. Beautiful People, you think? Would, what would be the a, biggest thing he did in his original? Yeah, Beautiful People was, was huge. huge. I heard that song. every fucking where. Beautiful People. I remember when we went to go see him and he was ripping out pages out of a Bible. So that's all. <laughs> I love the fact this video is so fucking 80s. Oh, yeah. Has all well, the again, 80s Well, this is tropes. 81. So oh, just, this is early days. Oh, yeah. And it's this is a very visual. It's a very visually arresting video. So you can see where that would help give it momentum. And uh, do you know who directed this video, by the way? Tim Burton. Russell Mulcahy, who would, of course, go on to Highlander. Oh, no shit. There yep. can be only one. There can be only one. So uh, this song. It's Kim Carnes. Kim Carnes is the only one. Yes. So, uh, Mac, how familiar were you with Betty Davis Highs and what we played just now? I know this song. I've seen this video. Oh, yeah. That's how so familiar I am. That familiar. How, how did you feel about the song? I don't know. That's just one of those songs that is... It just is I don't know if you. I would ever if you, buy, this. if you buy the greatest 80s hits, it's always on there. Mm-hmm. It's like near the middle of the list of 80s. Well, no, one hit no, wonders are pretty two. reliable yeah. on that It's regard. on disc two. Yeah, like disc two. Middle. It's disc two. It's not on I disc I don't know about that. This was like the number one song of 1981. Yeah, but there's like nine other years. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, well, you'd think that, well, I, I guess if you want a stronger finish. I'd said it's in the fucking box set. It's, in the, it's just yeah. on disc two. Maybe even <laughs> high up on disc two. It's not on disc one. No. It's on disc one. It's not It's it's not your opener, man. You've got a 20 some odd it's track on the, it's CD. On the, no, it's, no, no, like, no. it's like behind Oingo, Oingo Boingo's Dead Man's Party. No, it is not. Way be, yes, no, way it behind is not. Dead Man's it Party. Is. Way behind Dead Man's or weird, Party. Or Weird Science. It's like right behind those two. <sighs> Anyway, behind Kenny, it, uh, no, yeah, it's okay. But, it can make your mixtape. It's, it's the number mix- one song of 1981. You're talking. said it's in the box set. I said it's in the box set. It spent it's just nine on weeks in number one. It was Billboard's biggest hit of that year. But okay, sure, it's behind Oingo fucking <laughs> Boingo. Sure, okay. I, I know you guys are winding me up at this point. Fuck you both. It's um, a dead man's party. Who could ask for more? Ah, you're singing too, motherfucker. See? See? That that's a that disc tells one you it was track. right behind. That's a disc. Well, no, that's. That's like a nerd chest, and we all failed. Uh, nobody gives a shit about Oingo Boingo for the most part. Danny Elfman? Damn you. Danny Elfman is a noted film composer. Normal people don't give okay. a fuck about Danny Elfman. He just, yeah. he just self-served himself. I know. Um, burn. Let's, let's forget about Kim Carnes' fucking <laughs> beautiful <laughs> library and filmography. <laughs> You've, you've made your so what, what is the song about Mr. Fixit and, and how and Betty, what Betty Davis's eyes okay and how she's what is it uh, turmoilish or what does she say she's uh, to munch to I don't know she's shall, uh, shall I read the lyrics I think they're really yeah, go good ahead, lyrics yeah. okay her hair is Harlow gold speaking of Jean Harlow famous film star her lips are sweet surprise her hands are never cold she's got Betty Davis eyes she'll turn the music on you you won't have to think twice she's pure as New York snow she's got Betty Davis eyes and she'll tease you she'll unease you all the better just to please you. She's precocious, and she knows just what it takes to make a pro blush. She's got Greta Garbo's standoff size. She's got Betty Davis eyes. She'll let you take her home. It whets her appetite. She'll lay you on the throne. She'll take a tumble on you, roll you like you were dice, until you come out blue. She'll expose you when she snows you, off your feet with the crumbs she throws you. She's ferocious, and she knows just what it takes to make a pro blush. And the original version is crow blush, by the way. All the boys think she's a spy. 
eye. She's got Betty Davis eyes. Very saucy lyrics. Again, the Jackie DeShannon version is so bizarre in that it is not sexy in any way. Even though the lyrics are very... She's going to throw you on the on the throne and like... She's going to fuck you. She's going to yeah, fuck you till like, you're... It's like yeah. a Cleveland steamer or something. It's like, Whoa! She's, oh, she's, if anybody's going to, perhaps. Yeah. Welcome, to one, uh, welcome to one log each. <laughs> well, she is going to fucking oh, tear yeah. you up. She's, she's catching that date. She's on that train. As I've mentioned many times on the podcast, when I was growing up, it was mostly oldies and country music. And then my mother marries my stepfather and he's got fairly similar taste to her. You know, if anything, the oldies get older around him because there's more 60s and then he comes around and I'm hearing more 50s shit. This was his third marriage. He didn't have many in the, much in the way of artifacts from the first marriage, but the second marriage, for some reason, he had some leftovers of his ex-wife's music. Uh, he had a cassette tape with some pretender songs on it and I, I don't even remember if I ever listened to it. I just, uh, something about the name, I seemed, had like an odd allure to it, but I don't remember really listening to it. Maybe I did. I, uh, you know, Brass and Pocket always was familiar to me. But there were a few 45s and one of them was Betty Davis Eyes and it came from that ex-wife of his. And because I had that record player, the suit box record player, I was going to play whatever I could get my hands on. So this was actually one of the first pop songs, not too far out from release too, so it was contemporary still, that I got to listen to on a regular basis and helped expose me to modern popular music. Also, nobody sounds like Kim Carney. She has got a gravelly voice for a woman that's just incomparable to anybody else. She's like the Joe Cocker of female singers. That kind of gravelly tone is not what you would associate with women. And yet, the lyrics are very provocative, and her delivery is very robust. It not only introduced me to a sound that I wasn't terribly familiar with, especially that synthy new wave kind of sound, but also a form of femininity that I wasn't familiar with. A very empowered... Very Dixie Carter. Yes, yeah, sexually... <laughs> Dixie yeah. Very uh, sexually aggressive in a way that I hadn't Once experienced. Blanche for, for Dubois. Me. And so I respect that, however. She also looks a little like Sandra Locke. And another thing that kind of came to my life uh, with my stepfather is that he was a fan of Clint Eastwood. We watched a fair few Clint Eastwood movies and there was a period of time where I really enjoyed those movies and enjoyed Clint Eastwood's performances. It wasn't until getting in the 90s I realized what a smug prick he was in most of his movies. But I definitely always dug Sandra Locke. I love that sort of ethereal quality she had. I like the eyes. I don't, I like that again, she had moxie. You know, she was always tough, broad, that would stand up to a guy as rough as Clint Eastwood. Ultimately, she usually got some sort of come up and she was often like kind of a hoity toity kind of person and Clint Eastwood would show her well, a real man could treat a woman. So it still had its caveman qualities to it. But she was still a formidable presence in a Clint Eastwood movie as a woman, which, and, and she appeared in numerous of his movies. He was the guy who he's got a girlfriend and so he's going to make sure she's getting parts which ended up being this big deal because when they broke up he sort of was arguably had arguably torpedoed her career and she ended up successfully suing him over that shit I associate all those things for that, that early 80s period this certain type of woman that I hadn't really been exposed to the certain kind of sound that I hadn't been exposed to and I really embraced it and you know I love synth music I love 80s new wave uh, and I love strong women like that I, I feel like this Kim Carnes song was very formative I listened to it countless times on 40 Five. Betty Davis. Are you guys terribly familiar with Betty Davis, the actress? That's the namesake of this song? No, I mean, I know of her existence. You know of her existence. You uh, neither? Actress. That's actress, all you got yeah. is actress. Okay. Did you ever see any of your later roles, like whatever happened to Baby Jane or anything like she that? She's the one that says, I'm ready for my close up, Mr. DeVito. No, no. Oh. She was the one who said, Buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy night. You know that one? No. Anyway, all about Eve. Great film actress. Always like a very intimidating presence. She was an early ball buster in movies. And I remember my grandmother liking Betty Davis because, again, just strong badass chick she also really loved Lucille Ball and what you may not remember is that before she became this big comedian in the 50s back in like the 40s she was actually kind of a sultry sex spot to some degree she was like the hot saucy wet redhead and my grandmother always loved Lucille Ball and uh, Lucille Ball for spent a lot of her career with a big red bouffant and my grandmother would dye her hair red and also had the big beehive bouffant style hair and she was a tough broad too she talked some shit my stepfather and my grandmother did not get it wrong because she called him on bullshit. She called everybody on bullshit. She could be a little bit uh, an oppressive presence. But I always, of course, loved her. And I would watch a lot of the movies that she liked. And I was exposed to a fair amount of Betty Davis. And again, Betty Davis was a take-no-shit kind of person. She called her shots. I respected Betty Davis. And I respected my grandmother's taste in heroines. And so it all kind of gets bundled together into me liking strong, powerful women. This ended up being a formative song for me because of that exposure. And because I embraced take-charge kind of woman. Wow. Explains so much much now. <laughs>
Good Lord. You know, most people would have to pay $1,000 for that kind of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I, did a therapist unlock this, or you just know it all the time? That this was, this was ground zero. You, you, you want to know Davis the funny has, part? Betty Davis has this fucking liberal ground zero for this yeah, I'm feeling that. <laughs> I don't actually know what her ballot politics were. You know, I think she was cool with gay folk. Who, Betty Davis? Betty Davis. Well, because no, she I'm was, talking about the song, dude. I don't give a shit about Betty Davis. No okay. Offense, no oh, offense. but I will say, though, that she <laughs> personally wrote the both songwriters and Kim Carnes to thank her because her grandchildren never respected her as much as they did once she was the subject of a song. So she got to be cool and she again. Also, and she also sent roses to all three of them after that song won a Grammy. Oh, wow. That's pretty yeah. cool. So Riverboat Lady got a Grammy because... Of Kim Carnes' cover. cover. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Which also shows how important arrangements are. You get back to Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley doesn't always get the respect that I think he should be afforded because he didn't write his own song, but he did his own arrangement. And you can see that the two different songs are the same song, but one is a different arrangement than the other, and you can see what a huge difference a quality arrangement can have on a sure. song yeah, and totally that was different. well known for doing great arrangements you could easily play those two songs back to back and if you it was would just in the background nobody would even realize it's the same song yeah you, would, you would have no clue but anyway the only reason why I brought this up was because I've been doing finally getting out some comic reader resumes and I try to find contemporaneous music to the comic books that I cover on that show and when I see a song that I don't think is really noteworthy it's like well fuck I'm not going to waste that on a comic reader resume I'll save that for one song each and when you guys surprised me with us doing one I had nothing in mind I'm like well fuck it I'll just start going through the billboard 1981 uh, around the same time as the comic reader resume and it was the first one that hit where it's like I think there's a story in that because it was the number one song in 1981 you goddamn yes. right it was top of his list absolutely top of CD number two in the hits of the 80s That's what I'm saying the heart of the city is ABS CBS it's not real when it's light it's only real when it's dark the incomparable Betty Davis witness her versatility as a crazed spinster in Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, a lonely monarch in The Virgin Queen, and a bedridden widow in Phone Call from a Stranger. It was from him I learned what love really was. It's a Betty Davis Film Festival, May 18th through 20th at 9.30 p.m. on American Movie Classics. It's a natural kind of taste. Nothing else comes near. Seven up, cool as your thirst. Seven up, the difference is clear. Drink Seven Up. Seven Up is free from artificial flavoring and sweeteners. It has no coloring and no preservatives. It's a clean, refreshing taste. Seven Up, the difference is clear. Red Rose Radio. So I guess you're next, Mac. Oh, God. Okay. I don't know if you guys are, are, are uh, familiar with this song or not. Are you, you guys Clash fans? Yeah. I like Clash, Clash, okay. One of the guys I really like on Twitter, Andrew Weiss, just fucking loves the Clash and talks about them quite a bit. I'm not as into them, but I respect them. Rock the Casbah. Well, no, we're not doing Rock Casbah. Yeah, we're not going to do that. That's like... I wouldn't even need to play that. We, we would just talk about it. Anyway, here we go. London Calling? No. Okay. We stand by me always. No, I fought the law. No. <laughs> Definitely an iconic album cover. London, oh. Call it, London Calling is one of those ones that they always, yeah. like this is one of the greats. Feeling. That's how it's been all around me. 
recently went on a trip to meet up with a bunch of podcast slash blog friends in Boston. Second time that I've been involved with that. I think they might have done one in between. I can't remember. But it was mostly guys related to the Firewater podcast. Well, because they were doing one in Boston, that blogger I was talking about, Andrew Weiss, who's been doing a blog called Armageddon Time for years, which is named off a Clash song. I would love to have met him, but I knew he was never going to meet. I, I tried to get him on a podcast one time. He had no interest in that either. He doesn't do podcasts. He's a guy who used to be associated with a lot of the guys from Comics Alliance, and he never did jump over to there because he's just too kind of standoffish. He doesn't like that kind of stuff. And so I knew there's no way I was ever going to get to talk to this guy. But because he's told so many tales of North Wauburn, this burnout town, this old industrial town, and the lakes of arsenic and shit that's in this town, I knew at the very least I was going to try to stop by and like find a North Wauburn sign or try to find that lake for a picture just for giggles. We're in a kind of a rush to get to Boston. I figure we'll use Boston as home place and we can always check out all this stuff in the surrounding areas once we get to Boston. And Boston was such a fucking nightmare to navigate. It was so hard to get fucking anywhere because I've heard uh, Houston freeways occasionally referred to as a spaghetti bowl. Bullshit. We we're, we're might as well be on a fucking grid compared to Boston. There's nothing straight in Boston. No matter what you're going to do, it's going to take a minimum of a half hour. You can't go across a fucking street in that fucking town. There's no such thing as underpasses. Everything's a fucking turnaround. Everything's a fucking cloverleaf. And the thing is, Boston is an okay town. You walk around Boston, the, you know, even in the summertime, the temperature is not too bad. Uh, you got some breezes off the water. They've gotten cool looking stuff there. It's nice to walk around at night. But as soon as you get behind the wheel of a car, it's a fucking nightmare. And you're going to make wrong turns. And as soon as you make a wrong turn, you're in some weird industrial area. You got no business being in. It's, a, it's awful. And so as much as I wanted to at least try to do a drive-by Walburn, Boston just killed any ability to get out of the town. There's all these uh, sites that I wanted to see around the Boston area. I just gave up because that town was just too fucking much of a nightmare to navigate. So sorry for hijacking. You can now talk about your Clash song. Hey, my song was uh, Lost in the Supermarket by The Clash. And so this song is from the 1979 album London Calling, which is probably their most famous listened to album. I, I've heard people call it one of the greatest albums ever produced. It's I'm, I, phenomenal. So I picked so this song. I'll just read what uh, Wikipedia says the song's about. This song's lyric describes someone struggling to deal with an increasingly commercialized world and rampant consumerism. The song opens with a strummer's autobiographical memories of his parents' home in suburban Warlingham, with a hedge of which I could never see. Quote unquote. I like that line. With the lines, I came here for that special offer guaranteed personality the protagonist bemoans the depersonalization of the world around him the song speaks of numbers about suburban alienation and the feelings of disillusionment that come through youth in modern society i love the shit out of this song and a lot of it is because i don't know i kind of just felt and there's like another lyric in the song that talks about i wasn't born so much as i fell out yeah how the guy just sort of sort of drifts around life and hearing his neighbors fight in the on the floor above them or like the first feelings he ever felt was hearing people fight above them and stuff like that and it just reminds me so much of my family and i moving all over the country from apartment complex to apartment complex and you meet people but before you really have time to become friends with people you're moving again or you become friends with them and then you move again so you just sort of kind of get dead inside and it's not not dead inside maybe that's kind of hard you just kind of numb and you so th- that's kind of how it is you're sort of just drifting from place to, you're just lost in the supermarket oh it's time to move again all right i guess we're moving it we're going to another new school i guess we're doing another new school i'm glad i spent all that time getting to know those people people won't do that next time and then you don't and then you end up staying longer than you thought you'd stay and mm. then, then you find out oh I actually had time I could have met and, and, and met some people and then you move again and it's or we got evicted from this apartment so now we're going to move to this apartment or you know what I mean it's, it's just it's just this non-stop churn of life that just moves you around everywhere and everywhere and, and you just kind of get desensitized to it and you stop opening up to people and and so uh, this song has always kind of taken me back to that but, but uh, the other reason I really love this song too is that the talk of the supermarket that I, I feel like everybody has memories in a grocery store growing up, right? Mm-hmm. You've all, the, the time you got lost and someone had to call over the loudspeaker because your mom was standing up front, she couldn't find you, or you know, or you or you pickpocketed for the first time, you grabbed some candy out of one of the aisles or whatever, or you go to the magazine section and you're flipping through magazines while your mom shopping because you don't want to tag along with her, so you get to flip through the lowrider magazines, right, with the hot chicks in it, or the comic books or whatever. And well, if you've ever seen the movie Heather's, uh, they, there's a character in there, with JD, that moves from place to place and his frame of reference is the convenience store you gonna pull a super chug with that no but if you're nice i'll let you buy me a slushy i see you know your convenience speak pretty well yeah well uh i've been moved around all my life dallas baton rouge vegas sherwood ohio has always been a snappy snack shack 
Any town, any time. You can pop a ham and cheese in the microwave and feast on a turbo dog. Keeps me sane. But express the same sentiment. So it's it, so the song kind of has two meanings to me. One, sort of this this growing up, just floating through life. And on the other hand, I have this weird nostalgia towards supermarkets. Supermarkets, because that was sort of the everywhere you moved, you'd have the new supermarket you go to, and you'd have to learn. Oh, now we're shopping at a Gerlins in Deer Park, and you sort of learn the the layout, and you learn where this is and where that is, and that's where you oh you'll run to somebody from school there, or you run to your teacher, so your mom gets to meet the teacher, or you know what I mean, stuff like that, or you have to run or you get a job there because people growing up that's part of you know your rite of passage you get a job at a supermarket and it's this this weird thing nowadays where people don't fucking go to supermarkets anymore they do they're overwrought with people right but and more and more you just you order it online or you know what i mean like oh that they used to be the one universal constant for everybody is we all had to go to the supermarket to buy our shit and now or every place that used to not be the supermarket is the supermarket mm-hmm. so it used to be well you would never go to walmart for groceries well now you go to walmart for groceries too target. Or you go to target for groceries or you go to your local heb grocer and they sell couches and lamps <laughs> and toys and all and like it, it, it's just oh, and and grills and park benches and shit like it, it's just this weird there's nothing special special about it anymore it's it's turned more into what the song is about even in a lot of ways where it's just this it's just a building now where you know i feel like for part of my childhood that was like the place that like you said the neighborhood grocery store that was where we all went and where it kind of seemed like shit happened and it I just it's kind of weird to me that like my kids aren't going to grow up in a in a time where you're going to go to the grocery store. It's just going to be an Amazon box in the porch. It's an it's what it's going to be or you're going to do curbside pickup or they're going to just do straight to door delivery which is I feel like what we're moving to more and more rapidly or somebody picks up cuz I see it. I walk around the grocery store now and there's people who push around these giant carts and they've all got numbers in them and they're just picking up the grocery lists for these people and they're going to go in bags and they're either going to be handed to somebody who's going to deliver to your house or you're on the curbside pickup outside and they're going to bring it out to you put it in your in your uh trunk and roll out and to me it's just so weird and i know there are other you know we talk online and people used to not be able to talk online you can keep in contact with people you used to have to write letters to keep in contact or talk on the phone you'd have to call long distance to talk to somebody and now you can just do that stuff online and that's great but i feel like that was sort of this weird it's going to be this bygone social construct that doesn't exist anymore like like when you when you watch an old movie and it says be kind please rewind we don't rewind anything anymore that doesn't make any sense you don't yeah. there's no such thing as rewinding it doesn't exist yeah. anymore and it's just like i feel like it's this old part of my it was such a huge deal of my childhood and i I just feel like it's kind of floating away and leaving. Well, it's like, really bizarre. When I was talking to Keith J. Baker when, when, during that get together, uh, for some shout out, up, shout yeah, out, it came up like the, the, most of the people who were at the thing have daughters, and not to be sexist, but there was a, a, a notation that none of the daughters will break down boxes. Like when you go to throw something away, they throw away the box intact, and all the guys were like, "No, you, you tear the box apart and you compress it." And then Keith had and myself had both worked at grocery stores, so we just started bonding over the fact that we. Used to you know break down the big uh, cardboard boxes and put in the compressor and you hit the button and you compress it and you strap them with the the uh, plastic straps and shit and it was just like this like whatever differences we have in life and politics and everything else we both know what it feels like to press the button to do the crush and there are kids who are never going to do that in part because that's not a kid's job anymore you don't have sixteen year olds at the supermarket <laughs> right. anymore grown ass people are doing that shit and that's their like fucking career because that's where the economy is now. Um, but yeah, you lose that universal. We used to all work at grocery stores or at fast food places, and we'd all have this universal experience where somebody could grow up in a, another part of the country, and you could still bond with them over that shared memory, that shared in- experience. And we don't have that anymore, aside from the bullshit internet stuff, where you're you can always turn that off, and you can always present yourself as somebody different from who you are because you're not really there with that person day after day, sharing an experience. And so it's not the same. You're not seeing the whole the person the same way you would when you actually spend time with them or when you do a trade and you can relate to each other on this these similar experiences or or, or when hey man i got something to do can you pick up my shit for me and somebody mm-hmm. goes you know dude i'll pick up your shit for you so you can get your thing done like to me that's just way more genuine you know what i mean but i will also say the reason a lot of those uh experiences don't happen now too is because fucking school for these kids is outrageous now dude the demands on these kids in school is insane so more and more often like kids don't get jobs mm-hmm. in the summertime to work because they, they can't they can't. 
can't. They, they can't s- anymore. Study, you need yeah. to already be starting your. Oh, you're, you mean you're not taking you know prerequisite college courses in high school during the summertime? Mm-hmm. Like you don't even have a summer anymore because you need to be well, doing you, you extracurricular. Spend, you and you don't and spend like a quarter of your year off. Yeah. You know, a, an employer wants three months of you at this grocery store. You know, your summer job working full time as a teenager, and if you can't do that, then they're going to hire some middle aged. You're not, you're not writing your college admission essays. Yeah. Wait, have you studied for the SAT? Because if you don't mm-hmm. get a high school in your SAT, then you're not going to be eligible. Like, there's just too much pressure on these kids. Yeah. And I get that too. But I, I just find like it's this weird piece of Americana. I'm not even Americana. I mean, I don't know. I, I, yeah, Australia. I think that's an international well, experience, or was at one time. Yeah, exactly. The, I, I think, just it's think it's evolving because, like, I fell in love with these Aldi stores. I used to hate going to the grocery store, and I'm in love with this store where you walk in and they have literally one of each item. You just walk in. And out. Aldi is very old school. I'll give it that. I, I just discovered it like last month and. Fell in love. How fast we're in and out. It is kind of weird that you have to put a quarter to get your basket. I, I think that's cool as hell. But yeah, they, I, they, I think they, it's yeah. Fa- I they do that in Germany still. I think that's fantastic. It's, so you it, have it, to return your basket yeah. to get your quarter back. Yeah. And there's only like four employees in the entire building, and they don't. Do I don't know. That's so great. You. Well, no, no, they're fast. Like they'll. I know, but that there's only four employees in this big supermarket. No, it's not that big. All these they're, are big. Yeah, Dude, they're, they're tiny. Big. Yeah, it's literally like three rows, and they sell. It's like it's smaller than like a Trader Joe's, and they're small. Again, the thing I love about it is they have. One ketchup, one mayonnaise, one mustard. It's not like there's ten of them. What do I pick? You just grab, grab, grab. So I've caught myself got going to the store and actually, where you know you're going to spend an hour in a grocery store. I'm in an hour like fucking fifteen minutes. I love those stores. So, but I see what you mean, like the experience. Of I, I think I think maybe the song you're wanting to apply to is "Freedom of Choice" because that's not the song that he's talking no. about. Well, Freedom of choice is what you want. I think the store will always be there, but it's just going to evolve. I know. I just mean, is it being part of the, oh, I ran into so-and-so at the grocery store. Yeah. Oh, we talked about this. But, oh, I saw and, the so-and-so boy at the grocery store. Or, you know what I mean? Well, I don't know. It, it's like, I, feel like it's, I think it's like the mall. You know, the yeah, mall is exactly, also yeah. the, the communal space. It's like, again, when I worked at the grocery store, I ran into one of my old English teachers. I uh, While I was working there as a stock boy, I ran into the mother of a gal that I knew for years and was somewhat close with and was a friends with my mom and stuff. It's like that, I would never meet that person again because I would never be at the grocery store to, for that to happen again. You lose that. You lose something when you lose those communal spaces. Like there are people I work with that I live near and you, I never see them. Except like isn't work. it weird that I live here 365 days a year? I shop here. I drive everywhere. My kids go to school here and you never bump into them anymore. Like it's it just seems to me like 20 years ago that would be unheard of. Of course you'd run into you'd run into the grocery store. You'd run and it's just like it does everything so compartmentalized, and spread out now. Yeah. Or you don't even have to leave your home to do most of the shopping you would have yeah. done anyway that or if you're you're hitting all of you there 15 minutes you're back at trials yeah. you know what i mean like i don't know so again th- this song just really first of all it's just a, a great catchy mellow song a lot of people think of the clash as being kind of all in your face with rocking mm. the casbon stuff Punk. this is a real mellow song deep, but would i mean it, i i think it it is especially for, you know like i said for me that uh it reminds me a lot of Pulp's Common People, you know, where you can, if you've had those kind of lower class experiences, there is a universal, like, universality yeah. to that as well. Yeah, it's like, uh, and I guess and, if you have like, it's like, oh, a guy, you know, sing, oh, he must had a hard life. But, you know, I, I think that if, if you've been in some of the situations that he's, like, if you've been in the apartment where you hear yeah. your neighbors above you fighting, like, yeah. it, it, you're going to trigger that feeling yeah. in your head where you're like, oh, great, they're, he's beating up his wife again. Like, right. you know what I mean? Or, or you're or next door or whatever, you can hear yeah. him fighting and stuff. Uh, it, or a hedge that you can't see over yeah. that you know you hear things happening and you never you can never get a chance to look over that hedge or 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 the lyric uh, that I mentioned earlier about well what I think is also interesting you weren't born is, you just is, fell out as you talked about uh, here too is he's talking about this loneliness and how he's disconnected from everybody but he has some connection just hearing the sounds of the walls of other people living their lives and and I think that you you have these notations about how he's gotten famous he's gotten let's see what's the line he says I got my big hit discotheque out. Album, I empty a bottle. I feel free. Uh, there's this is a person who's gained success. Uh, he's uh, the, the autobiographical elements are definitely clearly there. Yeah. The Clash has gotten a big fame, gotten famous, and he's still lonely. And being famous, he continues his loneliness because he still can't connect to people because he couldn't connect to people before because he's a lower class person who just couldn't connect. And now he's got the success, and he is connecting to people in a way, but not in a way that's fulfilling him. So he's still trapped in that same space, he's even lost. though. His circumstances have changed. Yeah. Lost in the supermarket. Lost in the supermarket. He came in here for the special offer. Guaranteed personality. Not there, man. That's my song. I love that deep. song. Well, my shit ain't that deep, but... It doesn't have to be. So this is my song. This exact copy. Fuji Boy. You know who that is? That's, Fuji Boy. Yeah. Boogie Boy, sorry. Have you got the papers that China gave you? 
product of its time. Dance like that, Frank. Oh, I have danced like that. Please tell me you'll dance like that one day, man. I have danced like that. Yeah. So that song. What, what is was that the song? song? Okay, it's Devo. Jacko. What do you say? Homo. Jacko Homo. Yeah. Um, that song, for some odd reason, is my introduction into the nightlife that I would slowly embrace as a young man. I remember going to a local club. Should I say the name? Yeah, you yeah. say the name. Numbers. We went to Numbers. I was young, way, way young. And this is the first time I can remember me and my friends getting in a vehicle and driving to downtown without without adult supervision and going to a club. And the DJ was playing this, like kind of like a warm-up. They had this giant screen that was just sitting there. Yeah, they, they actually projected. The, yeah, they the, project and this stuff. is from a mini movie that DV, Devo made back well, they, in the 70s. They would pro at least the two or three times I can remember. I mean, we went to this club in that first year a bunch of times just because we could get in. And it was just kind of cool. But I remember going to that club and watching this and feeling like, I think I'm an adult now. Like, I'm, I'm not a kid anymore. I didn't feel like a little kid. Like this is grown up stuff. I'm going yeah. out and doing yeah. Yeah. And so and I'm hanging out with my friends and like we're out late at night. There is no supervision. Like something happens, it's on us. No one's gonna save us from whatever happens. And I remember watching this as my friends are all like trying to figure out like let's get drinks. Let's where where we're we gonna go. And this club's just packed with like I mean back then they were called goth. I don't they call them emos now, but they're all goth kids and the clubs there's punks and there's cholos and there's just all these like kids from varied degrees of my age, which were young to older kids. And we're all in this club and this is playing on this giant screen and I remember watching this and I knew who Devo was but I'd never seen this and I was just like hearing this and then seeing where I was was kind of like oh shit like this is a new world this is I think anybody who has been to a concert in their youth knows that vibe you're talking about with, where with the warm up music playing yeah. and everybody's kind of conversing still you know what I mean you're all kind of getting like ready where am I going to stand during the concert yeah. and you're sort of you're trying to figure out where you're going to get Post in post up for the night yeah, yeah. yeah you're like how long is it going to take for the opening band to start is there an opening band I don't know you're all kind of talking trying to figure out where are we going after this well, see, see that to me honestly that would be a band further down this was just like I had never been to a club i've been with my parents but it was like you know spanish clubs or something like that where there was dancing and there's adults and there's supervision and there's safety this felt like someone had pulled the nets away from us and we were now by ourselves and i remember my cousin who was with us was super nervous because we had picked him up from his job and he worked at a, a pizza place and we didn't give him time to change so he still had like his little red vest and his bow pie his bow tie and so he had his uniform on still and he was like will they even let me in and i'm like dude I, I don't know if they're gonna let us in at all because i mean we're so young and they you know just checked you keep going keep going they basically just stuffed the club you could have drinks but not alcoholic drinks and um i remember a girl i liked was there and so she was we were holding hands and i'm like oh my god i'm holding her hand and we're in a club and it was just so exciting to be in this new experience and then we you know we went to that we went to numbers like a shitload of times after that you know to go see shows and stuff there but I, for some reason every time i hadn't heard this song in a long time and um I just had like some kind of mix going on, and this song came out, and it's just like a flashback, and I just remembered like you get that weird like yeah, feeling like, in your chest, butterflies like, in my stomach. Yeah. I remember like I, I distinctly remember walking into the club, and you see the screen up there, and they're playing it where the boogie boys running. And I'm watching it, and I'm like, what? And so we're walking in, we kind of post up to the left, we're sitting there, more people are coming in, and I'm watching it, and it's getting louder and louder. You know, they're testing the light machines, so the lights will come on for a few seconds, turn off. I see some older people walking around, and and then uh, the girl that I like shows up and the, her friends come up and we're all like getting together. And it was weird because it's like a first meeting outside of school that wasn't a school event. Like it wasn't a football game or anything. It was like we're away from the city, from our, our part of town. We're on the other side of part of town. And so anything happened. And, and so 
going to numbers that first two years, I had a shitload of misadventures. We would just party together. It was so much fun. So in the montage of all these memories that you have, I'm guessing it's that beat going in the background. Yeah. And so I always always just have such a a fond for like first part of your youth where you're fucking up a lot. Now that I think we were relatively safe. I mean, it was nothing bad, bad going to happen to us, but we didn't know that. And it was was exciting to be in the club like night and then the club shuts at two and we're like oh shit what are we gonna do and like well you know and everyone knew and again this is before cell phones so it was like someone knew of a place that you could go and so we would drive and there's nothing there or that's how we found house of pies and like we learned about house of pies and you know someone told us oh yeah there's a place called house of pies you go down there and they're open 24 7 because we were gonna go to denny's and so we go to house of pies. And it was it was just a f- like like i said just that cool beginning where like you're kind of getting cool and so it's like oh so I just it's, heard this it's song. The, like, it's the music that plays in the trailer of that part of your life. Yes. <laughs> like if they they piece together a trailer of your memories. Dun, 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 dun. And then when I watch, because I remember the video, so I'm watching the video, and when he's dancing, I'm like, oh shit, that's Frank. <laughs> that's Frank. Right there. That's absolutely Frank. I, I'm, I'm definitely in the David Byrne uh, whiteness field. Yes, yeah, I, I, I so. fully own my whiteness, including my arrhythmic dancing. Yes. So yeah, but that was just my song. It's just it's a kind of cute song, and I've been listening to it a lot lately. I guess they, like they say. When you're older, you come back around in life. Like you spend your your mid early part of your life running forward, and then as you get older, you start kind of looking back more and more. And I've caught myself looking back more and more and s- noticing things like this that you know they bring back fond memories or just a little different things. So no, that's it. Yeah. Again, as I, as I got into my teenage years, I, I liked more alternative type acts and the like. And you would always hear on the radio them doing advertisements for numbers. And so I always felt like that was going to be some sort of a mecca, like some place where at some point I could go to numbers and that's where my people would be, right? And because, again, moving around too much and never having any money and never having a transportation, I didn't finally get to numbers until well into my 20s, probably late 20s. Oh, really? oh. Yeah. And so by the time I got there, and I was there with an alternative, well, I, it, it, I think I went one time on my own, and then other times I went with an alternative chick I was dating. And getting there, I realized I was too much of a straight. For the normal people, I was too weird. And then for the weirdos, I was just too much of a straight. And so I wasn't into drugs, and I didn't wear makeup, and I didn't dress correctly for it. And I just felt like, great, not only am I an outcast in the normal world, but I feel like I'm an outcast in the weirdo world as well. So like one of my memories for numbers was going there for like New Year's Eve, I think it was, and hearing the hives, hate to say I told you so, playing. And as you said, they would play videos on they would project on screen and stuff. And just listening to that, it's like, I like this song. I'm sitting in a corner by myself at a place for people who would otherwise normally be sitting in the corner by themselves. I'm the guy sitting in the corner in that crowd. And so it was a real bummer for me to finally get to numbers and, and be an outcast even still then. Uh, but it always felt like it was a little too cool for me. And having arrived there, I feel the same way. But also by the time we would be going to numbers, well, less more me than you, Devo's time would have kind of passed. Mm-hmm. So it would have been almost like a self-conscious attempt to hold on to the first gen weirdo kind of bullshit. But I recently did a deep dive into Devo because I was trying to find music for the Bonding Agents podcast. And I wanted to find something that wouldn't be typical spy type music and something that would f- reflect both my father and me. I think ultimately I f- reflect more me because I, I landed on Devo's cover of Secret Agent Man, the Johnny Rivers song. I don't know if he actually wrote it or not, but he's most famous for performing it. And it's got all these weird techno farts and stuff, and it kind of fits with the sci spy thing going on. And in finding that song, I also did a deep dive into the theory of de evolution and their ties to Bob and the uh, cult of the subgenius and definitely felt a kinship with Devo because of that same mindset. And I'm not so much younger than the Devo guys that I can't feel a kinship with their perspective on things, although they are boomers and they definitely had different experiences there. But it's also funny because these, as the frontline nerds at a time where it really, really, really wasn't cool to be nerds, these were like the guys who helped to make the weak geeks win. Mm -hmm. We're living in a time period now where the geeks have won and it's probably weird to be like a totally straight macho kind of dude because probably from what i see in the schools today those guys would be sort of like the people people would kind of hold at arm's length well, like, I, they, like they'd be segregated from everybody else because everybody else has embraced loving anime and k-pop well and, that's what and I, the sensitivity and their youtube channels and all this kind of bullshit. have you ever seen a tw- uh was it 22nd street or 21 jump street, 21 tra- the, movie. the sequel yeah the sequel were 22 jump street 22 jump street yeah, yeah where they go he goes back to school I thought and that it's was exact- the first one no 21 jump street's the first one the second one is the 20 20- 
No, the, the 22 is the one where they go to like Malibu and they're at no, spring break and stuff. Did, the, the original movie comedy remake of the TV show. Yes, but they did a sequel to it. No, you're, the scene you're talking about is from the, the first one with Jonah Hill and yes. uh, uh, Channing Tatum. Yeah, yeah. They, in, the, in the first one, the whole joke is that Jonah Hill is the, the cool nerd, one. Yeah. And yeah. No, no, no. The second one. No, but that was no the they first. flip it in the second okay, one back right. to where okay, he's. Yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah I, I, that's, I guess that's what you're talking about. I never saw the second one, so trust me. That's okay. the first. Well, and again, as much as I like Devo, like Jocko Homo, which it's actually taken from a 1920s uh, uh, anti evolution track called, I remember when I was that beat that earlier. Jocko Homo Wait, Heaven Wait, Bound by B.H. Shaddock, which again, it was an anti evolution track from 1924. But in a 1970s concept of it, would be associating athletic behaviors and athletic people with homoeroticism and stuff. It's like mm. all these guys want to get in the shower together and stuff. And it's a real trope now and today's weirdos would look at that and feel like oh you're, you're just playing into these awful stereotypes so where these guys were like frontline nerds now they would be seen as regressive and this was the b-side to their first single mongoloid which i've always been fond of that's a great tune it's all about how this person who appears otherwise normal is actually not as uh, at a mental parody with everybody else around him and because he functions in society he kind of gets by and I often would think about that song it's, it's a great tune and you can't even really bring up that song title because it's so like wrong mm -hmm. you can't there are words associated with a mongoloid that you are not supposed to use anymore and so it's like these are the guys who help to make nerdy stuff cool and, and a more progressive mindset cool and yet they're still so mired in a mindset that they were rebelling against that they would be targets of attack now these guys in the culture they were mocking they're too much a product of that so it's just weird how times change and stuff but i feel the same way i feel like as much as i'm a weirdo i i don't fit in with the weirdos and i don't fit in with the straights and devo is a soundtrack for that where you don't have a place even when you think you have a place you don't really have a place anymore because i don't belong in this time in this culture and it's all about being an outcast so yeah i definitely relate this song you got us, man. Don't worry. Yeah, Don't worry. I know. I got you guys. Uh, and again, with Mac talking about his song earlier, uh, I absolutely related to a lot of the sentiments he was saying there. And, and like, tell everybody the first year I'm out of school, it, nothing matters while I'm here. I'm going to be gone before the end of the school year anyway. And then I actually make it to a second year and I'm at a state school play and I actually am making some friends and making connections and the teachers know me. And of course, that's the year that we get uprooted and moved to a whole different place. And funnily enough, one of the guys who was in the play with me ended up being the boyfriend of my partner at the comic comic shop's daughter and so we kind of reunited years later because I, at least I finally circled back to being in a place that was familiar and had some happiness to it but oftentimes you move so far away from where any of those people would be you no longer have that connection anymore so I definitely related to that when you were well, earlier that reminds me of sorry to get back to my sad horrible song <laughs> like, it's a good tune I went through I, I, I was never, I'd never heard that song before by the way It's if you're ever just chilling in traffic yeah just put the song on zone out it's so good <laughs> I went through multiple semesters of school where I would go by the wrong name mm. and I just never bothered to correct right. it. And I would like, whether they go by my first name or my middle name, or I would get the initial, like J.R. Ewing, they were calling me like my first two initials. I have never, ever gone by my initials. I went a whole fucking semester by my initials because I just assumed we were going to move again. And it just, it didn't matter. And what was crazy is that usually somebody else in the class would correct them. Like, no, that's, that's Mac. That's not so-and-so. And nobody would correct them. And I would just go an entire semester. And then sometimes if I was there for like the next semester i'm like oh this is gonna go on for a whole fucking year i'd go ahead and correct and say no i go by mac or whatever and they'd be like why didn't you say something for the last several months and it's just like i don't know like i don't know it doesn't like but who else would ever like when you to me i just thinking about it right now who the fuck would go by the wrong name for months and months every day they call roll and i would say here present for the wrong fucking name because it doesn't matter the name y'all call me was given to me in first grade because the teacher looked at me and was like yeah that ain't gonna work that, this is your name that's too brown <laughs> yeah it's, this is your name from now on I have kept yeah that. but mine's not mine's yeah, perfectly true. normally white and I'm just like okay that's fine what is that that's what you're calling me now well that's what they typed on the roll that's fine we'll go by it and it's just like so fucking sad dude yeah. I look back and I didn't even have enough self worth to correct the teacher and I just went by a different identity for that semester <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Like where sometimes they would say it and I wouldn't even answer because I didn't. I was oh I forgot in this class that's my name. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, dude! How did I not? Kill I forgot myself? my character. Yeah. Holy, yeah. The that's character I'm portraying this semester in Jesus this school. Christ. It doesn't matter because I'm not going to be here in six months. Yeah. Oh. <sighs> anyway. But that's, still, but that's still not as bad as Mr. Fix's dearest friends continuing to call him by his slave name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. My tongue doesn't do the thing y'all need to to say your real name. So. Well, that, well, that's why I give you all the other choice. But but anyway, to get back to Devo, my experience with Devo is that I don't really have much of an experience. And I've, I've tried to get into the Devo water, and I'm afraid I'm going to get drug out by some sort of rip current. Oh, it's, and I just uh, can't, I can't. You actually like a bunch of Devo yeah, songs, though. You would never I, know I, it. I like, know like it. You like Nirvana. Do you like the song Turnaround? Yeah. Yeah, that's Devo. Yeah. I, uh, or, or if you like uh, A Perfect Circle, Freedom of Choice is a Devo song, you know? Well, or, and everybody loves whipping. Or if you like Weird Al Yankovic, Stare to Be Stupid, not actually a Devo song, but Devo-esque. Devo-esque. No, so but... much so that the guys were playing the stupid Transformers movie, and I, I, so we said, uh, that was Weird Al Yankovic. Like, I was like, no, that's Devo. And then I was like, no, that actually is Weird Al Yankovic. I'm <laughs> but, sorry. Uh, no, 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 my I favorite, should not have corrected my, you. I'm incorrect. My favorite is when they interviewed Weird Al, and they told him, they told him, you out devo Devo. Right. And they like bowed to him. <laughs> they're, like, well, you, Brothers you, said, they're, like, they're like, that is the most perfect Devo song, and we didn't create Created. Right. They were That's so hilarious. disappointed in themselves that Weird Al could create it. Dude, there's so many. I mean, my, one of my favorite scenes of a movie is Casino, where they're playing Devo Satisfaction as they're walking through the, the lobby there. I mean, dude, you'll see their music everywhere. I, I forgot how much music. Well, you guys fucking love Ragnarok. That's Mother, Mark Mothersboro, the whole movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. He scored that fucker. So, but this song. I, 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 Playhouse. I, I, mean, I feel like I'm down with Devo, but I, I'm never they're got so experimental. into Devo. Yeah. So, I, I this. I like their cover of Head by more. Like a Hole by uh, Nine Inch Nails. That one's kind of fun. This just reminds me more well, what, what I need to get So to when I was listening to this song and I was trying to pick a Devo song, because I actually had two of them, mm-hmm. and the other one reminded me of Photon, and I was just like, mm-hmm. no, I'll save that for another day. Photon? That's, y'all never went to Photon? What? Band? Uh, does it no, club? no, no. Devo has a song. I'm not going to tell the song because I want to save it for another one. But there used to be Laser Tag, but they called it Photon. Okay. Oh, okay. You're, you're I know Laser Tag. Yeah. Well, it was called Photon. Okay. Well, save it for that yeah. episode then. Yeah. Well, Welcome so. to Laser Cast. Just kidding. Laser Cast. Yeah, so, but yeah, no, so that's my song. That was a good one. Yeah, I like Thank it. I was uh, 24 when we first created Captain America. Jack Kirby was 22. There wasn't a day passed by that we didn't get news from Europe and the newspapers. Everybody was patriotic, and it was ridiculous not to do Captain America. I would have been proud to have said Jack and I did the Fantastic Four and let it go with that, but my gosh, at the same time, we were doing Thor, the X-Men, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. I went to the Bible. I came up with Galactus. The Silver Surfer is the Fallen Angel. And when Galactus relegated him to Earth, he stayed on Earth. When I was at Marvel, Steve Ditko used to come up and sit in my office. The quality of his art and the peculiarity of his art made Spider-Man the most popular costumed hero in the field. Today's flawed superheroes are superior in physical strength, but common, average, ordinary in mental strength. Saving the world, the universe, yet help us to solve their common, personal problems. It is like creating a perfectly physical adult with the reason limits of a six-year-old. When I first created Wolverine, I created him as a Canadian mutant, specifically so that whomever ended up with the assignment of writing the new X-Men book should it ever occur, would have a Canadian mutant handy if he wanted him. I think from my perspective, what makes Wolverine so attractive is the unpredictability. The belief that he doesn't give a damn about anybody but himself and spends his whole life proving that's not true. We thought that the Punisher would be a one-shot type of character, but there was also the sense that he had more depth and more appeal beyond just being an antagonist. Well, I think it's his damaged soul, like Spider-Man, is surmounting tragedy. I got a call out of the blue from two editors at Marvel Comics. We want to create a new, young American Muslim superheroine and put her on her own monthly comic book series. Since there was a possibility that this series was going to be an epic flop, I felt I was at liberty to tell exactly the kind of story I wanted to tell. I wasn't interested in writing some kind of model minority book, fanfic writing Pakistani American girl from Jersey City named Kamala Khan. 
When she wakes up one day with superpowers, the result of something called Terrigen Mist, which is an epigenetic terraforming gas created by a bunch of alien human hybrids called the Inhumans, she takes on the crime fighting name Ms. Marvel. The Marvel Handbook, the unofficial podcast of their universe. A legion of hosts take an encyclopedic look at Marvel's seminal directory of characters and concepts. Available for audio streaming from most of the usual suspects, as well as on YouTube. Brought to you by Rolled Spine Podcast. What the hell do you think you're doing? Dragging your butt through the day, selling body and soul to a bunch of bland normals? Acting stupid so they'll think you're one of them? Tired of getting all of the guilt, but none of the sex? There is a simple answer, dear friend. A glowing beacon of slack amidst the turmoil and darkness. It's J.R. Bob Dobbs, the living slack master in his church of the subgenius. Bob brings a new destiny for the abnormal, for Bob comes to justify our sins, to unmask the conspiracy, and to get us back the slack they stole away. It's us versus them. Are you going to fry in hell on earth alongside the pink boys, or will you pull the wool over your own eyes and accept Bob into your mind? Repent, quit your job, slack off, and praise Bob! Church of the Subgene is eternal salvation or triple your money back. This time on the Hot Singles Chart, 108 Sage, Dr. Ann, Bad at Shapiro Rap, Bone Dragon Comic, Chris at Bad Books for Beginners, Christopher Bush, Chronicles Podcast, Cinnabud Podcast, Delvin, Dark Web, Felix Slider, Ice in the Face, Iowa's Joe Crawford, Jack's Web of Chaos, who also noted Good Vibrations, Jeffrey Brown, Keith G. Baker, Ken Stark, Christados, Long Box Crusade, Linnell Skaggs, Michael O'Brien, Odell Abner Dracula, Rad Adventures Podcast Network, Randy Caldwell, Relatively Geeky, Ryan Daly, Sage. Age, Sean Michael Ortega, Secret Wars and Beyond Podcast, Seinfeld Podcast, Tim Price, Wonder Woman Warrior for Peace Podcast, and Zach Sally. One song each is a rolled spine podcast. This is a not-for-profit fan production. Any copyrighted materials used is believed covered under fair use, with no infringement intended. Please leave your comments and criticisms on our website. We especially encourage participation on this show. Feel free to call in and leave a request. Maybe you'll even get featured on the show. We thank you for your rapt attention. 